All right, so what's next? Um, our final exam is a week from today. So at 8 o'clock on Thursday the 13th, you'll already, you know, right now in, in a week, you'll be working on part one of the exam. Um, approximately speaking, the conceptual questions were, will be about 35% uh, of the points, you know, plus or minus, uh, and then problem solving will be the balance. Um, for the concept questions, you're not allowed to use any sort of outside resource. It's just your brain and a pencil and the exam. But for the problem solving, you may have uh, questions where you're allowed to use Excel. So bring your computer with Excel loaded on it. Uh, I'm going to provide any factor tables, and so you don't need to memorize those or copy them down onto your page of formulas and notes. Uh, so what should you put on the page of formulas and notes? Um, my suggestion is that you review the in-class exercises and the ones that have kind of a specific procedure, you know, for instance, the external rate of return. You know, there's kind of like a step one, step two, step three. Uh, refresh your memory on how to do that, but then also maybe you could provide a reminder on that uh, page that you're allowed to bring in. So that's a week from today. Um, our final topic of the semester, we're going to continue talking about taxes today, and we're going to go into the specifics of income taxes. Now, on the subject of income taxes, on the uh, quiz that I'm handing back, many of you um, kind of blurred the lines when we were talking about depreciation and why companies like depreciation. Now, as the value of the property decreases over time, it's true that the, uh, if they're paying property taxes on that equipment, then their property taxes would be reduced marginally. But the real value of depreciation is actually in income taxes. And the reason for that is that the value, the amount of the depreciation can be deducted against their profits. So they don't have to be paying, uh, they don't have to pay income taxes on the depreciation. And as a percentage or as a total dollar amount, the income taxes uh, is a much larger incentive for depreciation than any reduction in the property taxes are likely to be. So I just wanted to point that out. So income tax is what we're talking about today. And uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, before we do, though, I, I told you that we'd have a couple more kind of like thought-stimulating uh, concept questions. So this is the type of question where um, ask yourself, would you know how to do this? You know, would you be able to draw the cash flow diagram, including the labels and the symbols that should be on a cash flow diagram that illustrates that problem statement? So maybe if you've got the notes, you could just do a quick sketch that shows this. So at year zero is a line that's going up because you get money. Remember, that's, there's a, a sign convention there where we say a line going up means you're getting money. A line going down means you're spending money. So at year zero, you're getting P equals 5,000. Uh, we want to label somewhere in this area I equals 4.5%. And then the uh, loan repayment of uh, $969.39 each year for six years. So that means we have to have six arrows downward, each roughly the same length. And we should say A for a uniform annual series is uh, $969.39. So this is the graphical representation of that statement. Any questions about that? That's, that's reaching back into the archives for cash flow diagrams. All right. Another thing I like to throw at students is uh, I'll give you a figure and ask you to describe it. Or uh, you know, tell me a story with the figure. And by a story, I mean turn it into a narrative with some specific company. So there is a company and what with this figure? So does anybody feel brave this morning, willing to take a shot at, tell me about the company that this figure applies to? 
who's the lion-hearted savage that's going to take a stab at describing this? Andrea? Okay, good so far. Yeah. Okay, good. Perfect. Good. All right. I have two follow-up questions. How do they know what the MAR is? All right. How do they know what the MAR is? It is on the graph. You're right. Yeah, go ahead. Is it the percent where the um, present value, like the cost and the earnings equal zero? You're on the right track for sure. Yeah. What's the blue line? Cost of capital. Cost of capital. So it's, it's their borrowing costs. And why is the blue line going up as you move further to the right? There's more risk. What does moving further to the right represent? Borrowing more, money. Borrowing more money. So there's this company. And by the way, my second question was going to be, what does the width of those bars mean? Anybody know what the width, you know, like how wide A is versus how wide B is? Why aren't they all the same width? Worth maybe isn't exactly, but. Exactly right. All right, so project A only requires maybe $600,000 worth of investment. So that's how wide it is. So everything Andrea said is correct. They're lined up in order with the highest yielding projects first. So that's our top priority is the project that gives us the highest return. Now this blue line is getting bigger because the more money you borrow, the greater the risk is, and therefore the bank is going to be requiring uh, a greater rate to them. And so eventually there's an intersection where the project is returning either equal to or less than the borrowing costs. And at that point, you don't do the projects anymore. You don't do a project where all of your profit goes to the bank. You don't do a project where it costs more to borrow the money than you're receiving by undertaking the project. So that's the level of detail. You need to hit all of the uh, high points on a figure like this, everything about it, you need to explain how wide it is, how tall it is, why the blue line's going up, why some of them are shaded and others aren't shaded. You know, there's, there's a lot of information in a figure. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I don't expect you necessarily to write a thousand words, but um, there will be specific things that I'm looking for you to mention about each of the figures. And so go back through the notes and uh, go through the text and try and see, are there these special figures that are both in the book and that you saw in the slides? And if you saw a figure in the slides, then that means it's really important. All right? So I hope you'll uh, take preparing for the exam seriously. There's a lot you can do. You know, it's, it's not just up to random chance whether you do well on the exam. Um, you know, the, your grade depends on on your effort. And so uh, if you take it seriously, then the exam will go well. All right, so let's talk about income tax. You know, there was a time more than 100 years ago where there wasn't an income tax in the United States. And there are a handful of countries in the world that don't have income tax. But uh, the first income tax was instituted uh, during the Civil War to help raise revenue. And it was only 3% that was the income tax rate, and it only applied to income over $800. And back then, $800 was a lot. So there were plenty of people who didn't pay income tax back in those early days. And so it was a relatively modest income tax for a long time. Uh, in fact, people, when they started to have to pay 3%, they got all up in arms. So it was later reduced to 2% of income over 4000 now, $4,000 in today's terms is equivalent to about $113,000. So you know, only the so-called 1% back then was paying income tax, and it was only 2% of their earnings. And so it wasn't too bad. Uh, we're going to go through some tax tables today, and you'll get a feel for how does 2 and 3% compare to what 
actually uh, people end up paying as an effective federal tax rate these days. Um, this figure illustrates who has to pay income tax. And you can see that the United States is different from most countries in the world. And uh, this color, the magenta that the United States has shaded, what that represents is uh, countries where you have to pay income tax whether you live in the country or whether you live outside of the country, but you're a U.S. person. And so as a U.S. citizen, even if you are living in Australia and you're receiving no services from the U.S. government, you still are legally obligated to file a tax return and pay income taxes. Most other countries in the world don't have that. Like, for instance, Canada. If a Canadian is living in Djibouti, and they're earning money there, they don't have to pay income tax to Canada if they're living outside of the country. Uh, and then the, so that's the dark shaded blue. Uh, the light shaded blue, uh, people who are living in the country have to pay income tax. Uh, foreigners and citizens have to pay income tax. And then if they're living outside of the country, then they have to pay maybe a reduced percentage. So. Uh, the United States and, boy, who's North? Actually, I don't know what country that is. Maybe Ethiopia? No, Eritrea? I guess and my African geography isn't what it used to be. I think that's maybe Eritrea. But anyways, very few countries uh, have to pay tax on earnings when you're not living in the country. America is one of them. All right, so what we're going to do today, I think that the best way for you to get an idea of how income tax works is for us to go through a 1040A together. How many of you here have filed income taxes before? All right, some of you have filed income taxes. Do you remember which form you used when you filed income tax? Which was it? Easy. Yeah, easy is the most common for people in your circumstances because the, uh, the 1040 EZ is used when you don't have, for instance, like a, a mortgage where you're deducting the mortgage interest. Uh, the EZ is what you'd use if you don't have any stocks that you have to report the dividends for. And the 1040 easy applies to people who have um, income, but not a lot of itemized deductions. It's kind of just the simplest form, and that's why they call it EZ. Uh, the 1040, without any letter at the end of it, the 1040 is what you'd use if you have a really complicated tax situation. Maybe you own a business, uh, that you personally own rather than it being incorporated or operating separately from your own entity. The 1040 applies if you're going to be itemizing your deductions, meaning if you're dropping off a bag of clothes at Goodwill or if you uh, donated a car to the Kidney Foundation. You know, all the little things you can do to reduce uh, your income tax. Um, if you do a lot of that stuff, then the 1040 is what you'd utilize. The 1040A is kind of in between the two. You can use it if you have mortgage interest to deduct. You can use it if you have, for instance, student loan interest to deduct, and if you have stocks with dividends that you need to declare and pay the tax on. You can do that, but it's not used for people who have their own business. Um, and so like the more complicated, it's, so it's kind of like a happy medium. And that's the one we're going to go through today is the 1040A. Um, the main highlights that I'd like you to walk away from this exercise with is number one, how to determine the AGI. That's an abbreviation that becomes really important for a lot of your eligibility for a lot of uh, services and credits depends on the adjusted gross income. I'll show you the technique uh, that you can use to calculate your total tax. We'll do that by uh, looking it up in a tax table. And then another thing that most people, I'm talking like even you know, like grown-up adults who pay their taxes and fill one of these out every year, a lot of them don't know the difference between a deduction and a credit. So that's an, another really key item that I want you to walk away from this activity, understanding the difference between a deduction and a credit. So we'll go through filling out the 1040 together. I printed them out for you yesterday. And another reason why we're doing this is to demystify the process. Um, you've probably seen Jackson Hewitt set up at Walmart about this time of year is when they set up, you know, uh, usually January. Uh, you've probably seen H&R um, Block set up in strip malls. And you know, it's fine to have people do things for you, but you shouldn't do it because you're afraid. Or you shouldn't do it because, you know, it's, it's something unknown. 
uh, anybody can do their own taxes. Now, how much time it's going to take may be a different story if your situation's really complicated, but um, my tax situation is pretty complicated, uh, and I do my own taxes, and I always have. And it takes a couple of hours, but I think it's important to know what's going on with your finances. And so that's another main reason we're doing this together is to demystify uh, taxes. And so uh, the first thing, just put some fictional nonsense here in the top section for the name, social security number. You don't actually have to put your details in there. But I just want you to know, first of all, uh, this presidential election campaign. This section is actually kind of interesting. Uh, it's a good idea, but unfortunately, it hasn't had any impact for the last, oh, maybe 15 or 20 years. Um, the idea is, if we all uh, donated a little bit of money to presidential election campaigns, then people who are running for president wouldn't have to take money from companies. And so they'd be our representatives instead of beholden to the companies that finance their campaigns. And so there's this line where you can say you want $3 to go to a presidential camp, uh, election fund, and it actually doesn't increase your tax due. This is the one thing where you get to say how you want your taxes to be used. And they're like, in an ideal world, I wish that I could say, I want, uh, I'm paying $1,000 in taxes. I want X of it to go to the schools. I want Y of it to go to foreign aid. I want none of it to go to the Coast Guard because I hate those guys or whatever, you know? Like, if you could choose where your money goes, that'd be awesome. This is the only place where you get to choose where some of your money goes, and it's to a presidential election campaign. So it doesn't change your tax due. It just changes uh, where it's used. The other important thing that actually is uh, affecting the tax rates you pay is your filing status. So if you're single, you pay more taxes for the same amount of money than if you're married. Uh, the tax rates are different. The deduction situation is a little bit different. And so there is kind of a penalty for single people uh, even when you're paying your taxes. Any questions so far? All right, now remember, this is the 1040A. Each of these forms is a little bit different, like what's in the lines. And you'll notice that there's numbers. You know, each of these sections or lines is numbered. And uh, you know, what's in line 7 on the 1040A is a little bit different from what's on line 7 of the 1040. But the adjusted gross income is something that would be on all three of the forms. And the total tax due is something that would be on all three of the forms. OK, uh, exemptions. Now, what the exemptions are for is that you can earn a certain amount of money and not pay any tax on it. And an exemption is worth $4,050. So what that means is that you, your spouse, and all of your dependents for each exemption you get to earn a certain amount of money without having to pay tax on it. And that amount is $4,050. So kids aren't completely useless, right? They are worth uh, exemptions. And um, what, the, what we're talking about with exemptions is it's a deduction. Um, the, remember, one of the things I told you that I wanted you to learn is the difference between a credit and a deduction. Credits are more valuable than deductions. Uh, a dollar of credit means that's a dollar that you don't have to pay in taxes. A dollar in deduction means that's a dollar you can earn that's exempt from taxes. But it's not the same thing as a reduction in your taxes. I'll illustrate the difference a little bit further. But I wanted to point out that these dependents are earning you deductions. That just means a certain amount of money, money you can make and not have to pay tax on it. Um, the dependents, someone can only be your dependent is if they are under 19 or under 24, if they're a student. And uh, if, you, if you provided more than half of their support. So in your case, if you're paying your own tuition, and if you're paying your own living expenses, then your parents shouldn't be counting you as an exemption anymore. You should be able to count yourself. And if they count you, then you can't count yourself. Uh, so you don't get the deduction 
on your own taxes if someone else is claiming you. So that's kind of an uncomfortable situation where you tell your parents, uh, don't claim me on your taxes anymore because I'm claiming myself now. <laughs> and they'll say, well, good. Well, we won't give you any more money. So, um, The other thing is that if the child is under 17, then they are, uh, you, you get an additional tax credit. And remember, credits are more valuable than deductions. And so dependents, you get a deduction and potentially a credit if they're under 17. So you'll notice here, you write the number of you know, yourself and your spouse here. So fill these in. Actually, write these numbers. Let's say that you've got you know, kid number one, kid number two, kid number three. You don't have to write all their details, although on a real tax form you would. But check the boxes to illustrate that you're going to, you know, they're under 17 and they're going to be counted later on for credits. And then fill in these boxes so that we can calculate the number of exemptions we're going to use later. All right, so is everybody with me? How many of you have uh, ever received a W-2 before? If you've worked, you should receive a W-2. I mean, like, unless you're working, like, raking leaves or something for a neighbor. But, I mean, if you have a, a job, a, a steady, uh, ongoing job, whether it's full-time or part-time, you'll get a summary like this, usually in January. Uh, sometimes maybe they come in February. They're supposed to come in January. And it lists how much money you earned, how much federal income tax was deducted, uh, how much wage was subject to Social Security withholding, the Social Security tax that was paid, Medicare, and so on. So let's say that you and a spouse jointly earned $9, no, $96,776.92. So that's how much money uh, was wages. And so put this amount on line 7. On your handout, line 7, wages, salaries, tips. And if you're filing electronically, you don't have to include the actual paper that your company sent you. But if you're mailing in your tax return, then you'd have to staple these papers to your tax return. Because <coughs> they want to see that summary. OK, so line 7, 96, 776, and 92 cents. All right. <coughs> now, Schedule B is a form that you don't have. This is something that you'd have to fill out if you owned, uh, if you had money in a bank account and you earned interest on it. And so let's say that you have three different bank accounts, and what we're trying to figure out is how much to put into line 8A. Do you see on your paper where it says taxable interest? Attach Schedule B if required. Well, that's how you know to go get a Schedule B is if you have taxable interest, then you need to fill out Schedule B. So let's say that we do. And so we've filled out Schedule B, and then the, uh, the subtotal that we've got here, enter this result here and on 1040A, line 8A. So under taxable interest, let's say that you, you earned $648.27 in taxable interest from your bank accounts. So write that on 8A. Does everybody have that amount written on 8A? Six forty-eight twenty-seven. Because if you earn money, whether from work or from interest, you have to pay taxes on it. <clears throat> OK, now what about dividends? Uh, dividends, remember, are payments from companies where you own stock. So let's say maybe you have three stocks, Microsoft, General Electric, and Veolia Environment. And they each paid you some dividends over the year. And so your total dividends that you now put in 9A is 7.47 and 55 cents. So this is just the back side of the Schedule B. Now, 
Now, TurboTax or programs like that, they ask you a bunch of questions. They like do an interview, and then it just basically is filling out this form for you. So they've structured the interview questions they ask to basically go through each of these steps and gather the info and do the calculations for you. But it's not doing magic. You know, those, those programs are convenient, but they're not doing anything that you couldn't do yourself. Uh, sometimes they help you to interpret the rules and whether things apply a certain way, but all of those rules are available in the instructions that come with these tax forms. Each tax form also has a separate document that's a PDF that explains the instructions and the rules. So um, this is taxes should not intimidate someone in STEM. You know, so an engineer who's taken a calculus class, you can fill your own taxes. All right. So. Uh, this goes into line 9A, 7.47 and 55 cents. Okay, so we go back through uh, capital gains. We don't have capital gains. Capital gains occur when you sell a stock. Like if you sell a stock and you get more than you paid, then you'd have to uh, write down the capital gains amounts. But let's assume in this hypothetical that we held stock, but we didn't sell it. Um, since our fictional person isn't retired yet, they're not going to be taking money from IRAs or pensions. We're going to assume that we don't have unemployment compensation or Alaska permanent fund dividends. We're not taking Social Security. And so our income only comes from the wages, interest, and dividends. And so add everything in line 15. Do you have your calculator with you today? Of course you do. You weren't sure if I was going to give you another quiz today, so you brought your calculator, right? So you're adding up 7, 8A, and 9A, and filling the total into uh, 15. Okay, so did you get the total is 98,172.74? So that's all the earnings, your total income for the year for this married couple. All right. Now, we're going the next section we're going to is the adjusted gross income section. And let's see what goes into that. Um, if you had student loans, and I know some of you will have student loans, then you go through a worksheet where you calculate the value of that deduction. So let's say that you paid $2,200 in student loan interest. In the instructions for the 1040A is where you'd find this little worksheet on how to calculate how much you're allowed to deduct. So $2,200 is how much interest you paid on student loans. Now you have to put in your total income in this worksheet and then the total amount from lines 16 and 17 and so we aren't taking any educator expenses we're not uh, taking an IRA deduction so that is zero we do the subtraction subtract three from two so it's still that full 98,000 now, if you're married for filing jointly, then you fill 130,000 in that field. Is the amount more on th four more than five? No. So then we can skip this next part. And the reason like this, why it asks that is if you earn over a certain threshold, if you make more than $130,000, then you don't get to take the full value of the deduction. But in our case, we do, because we're not making more than $130,000. And so the way that you know the student loan interest deduction is you go through these calculations to see if you're over an income limit. Because some of the deductions, some of the tax breaks aren't available to rich people. Or I guess rich, rich people is the wrong word. Uh, high income people. Because plenty of people with high incomes aren't rich, because they spend it all. Um, 
But this person is going to get to take the full deduction. So what that means is in line 18, write down $2,200 to represent the amount you paid in student loans, just the interest component of student loans. And that's a form that you'd get in the mail from your student loan servicer. You know, whatever bank that you're paying to after you graduate, in January, they'll send you a little uh, form that says how much principal you paid, how much interest, and then you can deduct it on your taxes. So now what that means is you can see the, how a deduction works. This $2,200 that you gave to the bank as interest, you don't have to pay tax on that. And so we had your total income in line 15. Now we have an adjusted gross income, AGI. And so the adjusted gross income is lower because the government says, well, any dollar you pay in these certain things, like any dollar you pay on student loan interest, we're not going to tax you on that dollar. You don't have to pay income tax if you spent it, if you spend a certain amount of your money on a few certain things. So if you're paying educator expenses, you know like when teachers go out and buy markers and uh, paper for their class, um, a certain amount of those educator expenses, they don't have to pay tax on that money. And the same thing in IRAs, an individual retirement account. So in some situations, people who pay into an individual retirement account don't have to pay tax on what they contributed. So it counts as a deduction. Any questions so far? OK, flip the page. You'll notice that line 22 says, enter the amount from line 21, adjusted gross income. So that same value of 95, 972, and 74 cents, fill that into line 22. So we're just putting it on the next page to have as a reference there. And we're going to go through a few more uh, credits and figure out how much the tax due is. All right. So um, figure out the standard deduction. So line 24. The instructions for line 24 are on the left side. So I'm not going to tell you what to put. See if you can figure it out. How much to put in line 24 is that little bubble box on the left side. Also figure out line 26. OK, so the correct amount to put on line 24 since our person is married filing jointly, is $12,700. Um, so what that means is that if you're married filing jointly, then you're not going to have to pay tax on $12,700. So that's another amount of money that the federal government allows you to earn that isn't subject to any income tax. All right, now then, what about line 26, exemptions? What'd you put for that? Perfect, 20,250, because we have, how many exemptions did we use? Five? Yeah, two, because you and spouse, and then three dependents. So that's five times 4050. So you should have in line 26 the uh, 20,250. All right, so here's what it should look like if you do the calculations. So we have the AGI minus the standard deduction gives us 83, 272, and 74 cents. And then we subtract the exemptions from that amount. And then the taxable income is 63,022. So the taxable income, remember how much did we actually earn? Like the actual total income in line 15 was like 98,172. But because this person is taking the standard deduction, is taking a, a five exemptions, and had the student loan interest deduction. 
they're only going to have to pay tax on 63000 So a certain amount of their income they could earn with no um, income tax due. Now, line 24, you don't have to take the standard deduction. Uh, let's say that you are big on donating to charity. You know, like, what if you donated $50,000 to some church? Well, then instead of taking the standard deduction, you'd go through a process that's called itemizing. So you'd list what are all of your mortgage interest, uh, what is your charitable contributions. There's a list of questions of uh, you can calculate itemized deductions or you can take a standard deduction. And uh, if you itemize, I think that's when you would choose to go for um, the form 1040 rather than this one. But I wanted to let you know that you don't necessarily have to take the standard deduction. Some people instead would uh, itemize their taxes. Okay, so if your taxable income is 63022 how do you know then how much tax you have to pay? Well, you go to a table. In the instructions for Form 1040A, there is uh, line after line of these calculations. And so your taxable income was $63,022. So what you do is you go to the row that has that amount between 63000 and 63.50. All right, so it's that first row. And then we find your filing status. And here again is kind of like that penalty for being a single person. Because if you're a single person, you'd pay 11495 in tax. But if you are a married person filing jointly, then you only pay $8,521. So in our case, the tax that you should fill in on line 28 is 8521. So that's how much tax you have to pay based on the taxable income. Okay, so now here's a question. If you um, if you were able to take another one dollar in deductions, how would that change your tax due? So let's say um, you know that you did the educator expenses thing. What if you were a teacher and you spent one dollar on school supplies? So that would bring your taxable income down to 63,021, right? So that wouldn't change your taxable income at all, you know? Um, if you, I guess the, the best way to explain it is <clears throat> if you had 63,100 as your income versus 63,000, it's only going to bring your tax down from 8529 to 8521. So that's a $100 income range and only an $8 tax range. So the value of the deduction, like $1 of deduction in general is only going to be worth maybe oh, 10 or 15 cents in how much it reduces your tax. Credits on the other hand, a dollar of credit reduces your tax due by $1. So that's why I say credits are more valuable than deductions, is a deduction will reduce your taxable income, but the amount of tax you pay is only a fraction of your taxable income. All right. So we've got some special credits we're going to calculate. Remember, the credits are the really valuable things. So we're excited now. This is the part where you're like, ah, oh, finally. It's all, it's all coming to fruition here. Uh, Child and dependent care expenses. So this is like daycare. So if you paid $3,000 in child care during the year, and uh, here's our AGI. It's depending on the AGI. So what that means is that if your income is over $43,000, you can only pay, you can only deduct 20% of what you spent. So 20% of $3,000 means that you get to fill in $600 in line 31. So it's not the full amount because your income is too high. If you had a really low income, uh, you know, below 15,000, then you could deduct 
uh, or I'm sorry, that your, the value of your credit would be 35% of that 3,000. But it's only 20% since our income is above 43,000. So fill in 600 in that line, line 31. Uh, child tax credit. Remember, for our three dependents being under 17, they're each worth $1,000. So you can fill in in line 35, you'd fill in $3,000. And you know, see where it says attach schedule 8812 if required? That 8812 is basically where you go through the instructions of finding out uh, what's their name, what's their age, how much is your income. Because if you earn too much, you don't, you don't get to take that credit. But let's assume that we went through the uh, instructions and we get to take the full thousand dollars a child. So put three thousand dollars in line 35. Is it? Well, that's sweet. Still, a kid costs more than two thousand dollars. So, unless you don't feed them very well. All right. So, okay, let's calculate the total tax now. So, total tax is. The, uh, the way that we do those calculations is we have the um, 8521, and then you add lines 31 and 35 together. So that's going to be the 600 from the dependent care expenses, 3,000 from the child tax credit. So line 36 will be 3,600. Now line 37 is where you subtract. Um, 36 from 30. So it's going to be 8521 minus 3600. And write that amount in line 37. And what you should get is $4,921. Okay. Line 38. Does anybody know what that is? That check box on line 38? What's that all about? Yeah, right. Because of Obamacare, you're required to have health insurance now. So if you don't have a full year of health insurance, then they give you a tax penalty. So here's where you're saying, you're declaring, yes, I had insurance. And the same thing where in January you get your W-2 forms and the interest from your bank is reported to you, your student loan payments are all tallied up. You also get something from your employer in January, like a certification letter that says, you had health insurance all year. And then that's how you know to check that box. And if not, then you can calculate the penalty as described in the instructions. All right. So assume we had health insurance the whole year, and so our total tax is $49.21. Any questions about this? Now, it would really be unpleasant if every year you had to pay this as a lump sum. You know, that'd be tough. Most people would struggle to just all of a sudden come up with about $5,000 in this case. And so, to try and reduce the uh, challenge of it just being a big bill that comes all at once, most people choose to have uh, payroll taxes deducted each pay period. And so remember the uh, W-2 form also says how much was withheld. And so uh, person one had 68.35 withheld. Person two had 31.44 withheld, and so the t the sum of that is 99.79. So this is just like those periodic payments where every pay period a certain amount didn't go into their bank account; it went to the government, and so it's kind of like your payment plan for the federal income taxes. So 99.79, and you can actually go to your human resources department, and you can tell them, I don't want any withheld. You can do that. Um, now, if you do, then not only are you going to have to pay it all at once, but there's sometimes a tax penalty if you go over a certain amount. I think it's maybe like uh, 
$2,000 two years in a row. Like if you owe the government a certain amount, then they'll penalize you for not paying it before the tax year ends. Um, but in our case, we already had plenty withheld because the total amount that we have to pay, the total tax is 4921 but you'll notice we had withheld 9979 So this person is going to be getting a, a tax refund because they already paid more tax than they actually have due. So in line 48, we can calculate the refund amount. So our total payments in line 46, right in... 997908 in line 46. And you'll notice that we skipped over a lot of credits. And you can go through the instructions in the tax form and learn about each of these credits. Or when you're you know, going through the TurboTax interview, it'll ask you certain questions that go along with these credits. Um, you know, usually you know if you did it. You know. Credits for the elderly or disabled, well, I didn't pay anything for the elderly or disabled, so I'm probably not going to qualify for that credit. But, you know, just from the, the description of some of these credits, you'll know whether or not they apply. The uh, refund amount. I think it's kind of funny that they make you say how much you want refunded to you. Like in line 47, you say how much you overpaid, but that's a separate line to tell them how much you want back. Like, shouldn't it just be obvious? I want it all back, idiots. Give me my money, you know? But they make you say, well, no, I don't want any of it back. You can just keep it. We'll call it even, something. I don't know. You can, yeah. You can apply it to your next year's taxes if you choose. But I'd never do that. I want my money, yeah. <clears throat> OK, so you can either have it sent by a check or if you give them your banking details, then they'll just do a, a direct deposit. Now, the uh, sad thing is when 46 is less than 39, then that's when you have to give them money all at once. And that's a bummer. I've had to do that for the last several years in a row. It's not as much fun as getting a, a refund. But that takes you through the broad strokes of how to fill your taxes. Now, it's not that easy when you're doing it for yourself because you have to gather all the paperwork together. You have to read through the instructions, make sure you're not missing something. But you know, if you've got an hour or two, you can save yourself the money and the time of doing it, having somebody else do it for you. Any questions about income taxes? All right. What we're going to do now is it's a survey of um, your perception of how the learning outcomes were achieved in the course. Now, this is different from the teaching evaluation that you just did online. Uh, what this is, is there are six outcomes in the course. Like, for instance, uh, are you able to compute economic equivalency values for cash flows, including uniform and non-uniform expenses and revenues, deferred annuities, gradients, lump sum payments or receipts, and salvage values. So um, the way it works is if you feel like this is a topic you didn't learn, then you'd choose somewhere on the low end of the scale. You know, one means I didn't learn it at all. Five means I learned it. So there's a series of questions related to the course outcomes. And then below that are the program outcomes. That's related to the overall engineering program. You know, this course ties into the ability to formulate, identify, and solve engineering problems. So did this course help you to gain that skill? And you'll rate you know, one on the low scale, didn't do it. Five on the high scale, meaning it helped you learn that ability. So uh, you don't have to write your name on this. You can just uh, fill in what your perception is for whether you learned the material or whether you didn't.
And uh, <coughs> when you are done with that, you can just uh, bring it up to the front of the classroom. You set it on this chair on your way out. And I'll just remind you that uh, our final exam is a week from today. Thanks for a great semester. I really love this class, and I've enjoyed teaching you. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or stop by my office during office hours. You know, If you're preparing for the exam and you want to go over some certain thing, I'd be glad to help you out. So just please let me know how to do that.